um, first of all, um, what is solar energy? I don't want to assume anybody really knows what the heck it is. And it's, it's a pretty amazing, you know, pretty natural thing that occurs. And effectively, you know, the sunlight, um, you know, hits the earth, uh, as you may know, incredible amount of light that we get on the planet. And so photovoltaic PV is a term you may have heard and PV or photovoltaic refers to the solar panels or the solar modules. And that name, as it says here, comes from the fact that photons are part of sunlight and they're converted to voltage or electricity um, through them hitting, in this case, uh, silicon solar panels. And there's other materials that are being used as well, but it's very simple. So that's why it's called photovoltaic is because the photons create voltage. So um, you'll hear that term if you spend any time around solar, people will say PV. And so I just wanted you to know what the heck that is. Um, now there's other electronics, electronics and technology beyond the panels that receive the power um, that take it and have it connect with the meters and the grid and obviously provide power to your building. So that's just electronics behind the scene. That's pretty straightforward that we already understand. All right. So now here, in addition to what is solar, here's some really important market facts about solar that will be good for y'all to know. Um, first off, uh, and this helps because, you know, people like spending time with and doing things that are popular. So look at that 90% of Americans um, per a research study by Pew Research, and they've done this more than once, about 90% of Americans said, we should do more solar stuff. Now, a lot of those folks may not really know what they what solar is or why, but they just think it's positive. They haven't heard bad things about it. It's um, benign, it's non-polluting, it works. It's been around a long time. So it's super popular. Secondly, and this is where I think I'm hoping to start to clear up some confusion or misconceptions is solar absolutely is affordable today. And since I've been in solar, which Connor referenced that uh, previous to being in the solar business for the last 10 years, before that I was 20 something years in the software and IT business. So now I'm in the solar business and we're experiencing similar things, which is, you know how it is, everybody has one of these computers slash phones in their pocket and these have gotten better, faster, cheaper, like we just can't believe. Same thing is going on with solar power because it's also technology that gets um, better and cheaper. And so incredible cost reductions of 66, probably pushing 70% now, just in the last decade since I've been in the industry and we've experienced such explosive growth. And so if, if it's affordable, then the other question is, well, how do I pay for this? Whether I'm a homeowner, like I was talking with Kristen earlier about, uh, or Allie or both of them about at home, doing home solar, it's the same thing. It's like, well, we don't necessarily wanna write a check for that project. Um, or take out of our working capital where we have other things to do with our, our, um, our retained earnings and our profits to finance and move our business forward. Um, so you can fund solar projects with all kinds of third-party capital. So that's really important to know. And if you look here in this chart, um, the green line represents clean energy capital. And, it, and that's only through 2015. It's continued to, to distance itself from the available capital in the market uh, globally and in the US, absolutely, compared to places where this kind of capital has been placed in the past, namely in the other sectors of, of the energy business like fossil fuels, as it shows there. So um, it's affordable. There's lots of money to help you, your business, whomever pay for it, and people love it. So it's got three really big things going for it. Now, when you get into then the snapshot of the financial value only. We're not gonna talk yet about the qualitative value proposition of solar. We'll get to that. Um, but the uh, financial, you know, stuff you can measure on the spreadsheet. So this image here, just to give you the context, is for a solar property, solar project on a building that's about um, 50,000 square feet of available space. So maybe it's a 75,000 square foot building. So a pretty good sized building, just to give you context of what we're talking about here. And so on this uh, quick financial snapshot, what I'm trying to show you is that here on the left, in the first year, you get 
huge tax savings. And this, this model here, by the way, assumes, as it says up, up front at the top, rather, uh, no money down, but you get immediate value and you get long-term value. And let me break that down. So there are, like there have been an energy industry and lots of business sectors in the economy over the years, there's something called an investment tax credit, ITC. So it's not a new thing. It's been around 50 years. It wasn't created for solar, but it's used by the solar industry and the treasury and the IRS have, have provided this to the industry as it does for other um, industries and businesses. So that if you, um, if you, if you procure a solar project, even if you put nothing down, you get huge tax savings year one. So you, as I like to say it, you get a, a huge bucket of cash or it's money you don't send to DC. You're not sending it to the IRS, it's money in your pocket. So you have to be a for profit, you have to be profitable in order to take advantage of tax credits as everybody knows. So that's the scenario here. So you get out of the gate with a huge financial windfall in year one. And then beyond that, you start to save as opposed to the, the bucket of dollars you get up front, then you save pennies and nickels and dimes at an increasing rate over time because uh, typically a solar project, if you do it this way, is financed at a fixed cost. So you know exactly how much the solar power is gonna cost forever, <clears throat> but the savings accrue at a penny or five cents or 10 cents per unit over time because the projections by the financial community is that grid power is gonna continue to rise in price, traditional power, on the order of 3% a year is kind of what the um, finance folks like to think about and uh, what they say. So that's where that savings is a forecast and you don't know exactly, but um, grid power historically has gone up, this will be fixed. And so that's how you get this incredible up and to the right picture of uh, the economics of your solar project. In this case is about a million and a half dollar project on a 50,000 square foot uh, rooftop. So just to give you some context and a snapshot, and there's lots of data behind it. So don't worry about that. And so let me break down some of the things we talked about and add a few other elements to the conversation. So first, as I mentioned, the, the tax driven savings are really significant. And the good thing about it is you don't have to apply for a grant or cross your fingers and hope you get it. Um, it's just a straight up piece of the tax code. Any tax advisor or CPA would look at it and go, oh yeah, I'll fill that in, put it in the return, boom. We're gonna get, set, we're gonna get that $700,000 credit on our tax returns for this business that owns this property. It's not tricky, it's straightforward. Um, second, you recall on the chart where it showed the ongoing gradually building savings over time, that's what the second point means is for this facility, um, I don't remember exactly. It was maybe going to produce, let's say, 70% roughly on an annual basis of the power needed for that building. And so for that part of the power budget, meaning it leaves 30% for the grid, that 70%, the CFO and the financial crew and everybody in the company will like to know that's a fixed cost. And the volatile variable part will only be 30% now, meaning the cost of power. And if any of y'all have colleagues or have done places, done business in places like the West Coast or in the Northeast where the price of power is much higher than Texas, because our power is cheap. I know everybody here knows that, relatively speaking. Um, in those places, that's a huge deal because price of power in the West Coast and in New England is, is off the chart. So they have an even greater amount of savings faster in terms of the operational savings on an annual basis than we do here. But we're still going to achieve that in, in Texas as well. The property is more valuable. So you've got a class A or a co-star five-star building one, building two. This one here has a solar power plant on it. Hmm, that's probably uh, gonna make my decision for me. Potentially it could either to be a tenant, I wanna move in that building because it's being powered by clean power or I'm an investor looking to buy a building. And I like that one because if it's not really common today, for sure in the next few years and the future decades, solar power on premier commercial real estate is going to become uh, pretty normal and an expected amenity. And in certain markets around the U.S., not North Texas, such as um, New Jersey, Massachusetts, California, and then global places like uh, Germany and Spain, where there's lots of commercial solar deployed, it indeed now is kind of a normal feature or a desirable feature, which does good things to the value of the property, whether you're trying to lease it or to sell it. 
Next, um, this is kind of a silly one that you might not think of, but if you cover your roof and you're expecting you're gonna have to budget in 15 years to replace the roof or do serious maintenance on it, you can probably push that out a number of years. So it's another way that it contributes to improvement in net operating income and OPEX because that roof repair under the solar array isn't gonna be needed um, because it's physically protected by the solar, which is very durable by the way. Um, so that's another thing to think about. And now you get into some other things that are a little tougher to, to measure. And this really comes down to kind of the uh, strategy of the business or the property owning entity is, you know, how important is it or how do you want to show to people you're doing real sustainability measures to run your business more efficiently, eliminate waste, not pollute, whatever of those things matter to you. Um, it's great that people go have Saturday volunteer groups of their companies and go plant trees with Jeanette at the Texas Trees Foundation, or we do whatever we do in our charitable lives. But this is everyday sustainability in the core of your business. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so that's, um, it feeds right into the brand value. And these days, uh, I've got young kids that, and two of them are, have entered the workforce and the youth of our country these days really seems to care about this stuff. What is my employer what are the companies I work with? What are they doing to be sustainable and, and be responsible? So if you can say 69% of our power is being generated by the solar array on the roof and all these other things that you say that you do to uh, make the company more responsible and sustainable, that attracts quality young people. It attracts customers. People vote with their dollars. It, it, it can have no downside. It can only help you. And so the question is, how does any entity use that in a creative way to message about their business and who they are and their identity um, can add value to the company in terms of greater sales or employment or whatever it may be. And, um, and finally, um, because we're dealing with the rooftop, unlike other things you might do to improve a commercial property, um, we're just, you know, typically you just stage the materials out in the parking lot. You might need a, you know, cherry picker and whatever else to get some people on the roof or get materials up there. But this is, these are non-disruptive. This is not like trying to come in and redo the water system in the building or replace all your lights with LEDs or replace all your windows and other sustainability measures, HVAC, elevator improvements. Those are disruptive and messy. This is neither. It's on the roof, it's non-disruptive and they get done on time. Um, so those are important things to know and just kind of summarizing the value proposition of solar on a commercial property. Uh, and knowing that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that NOI is one of the key metrics in the commercial property world, you know, these all have their, their ways in which they contribute to that improved economic picture of any given commercial property. So that's what solar contributes to. And the good news is, um, I made some reference earlier to parts of the world and parts of the US where there's a lot of this going on already. And um, I just love to pick out Target because everybody on this um, meeting today, I'm sure has been to a Target and has shopped in a solar powered Target because most Targets are solar powered. Um, around Dallas, I think all the Whole Foods are, uh, Ikea, uh, many Walmarts. Um, so, you know, think about it. Those brands, those big businesses haven't done this because they're just trying to feel good. They've done it because it is good financially and it's also good for their brand and uh, adds other value to the business. So I just show you this one example and then don't worry about the eye chart here. I, I don't want you to worry about that. But the, the point of this is on the left side, it shows Target, Walmart, Prologis, who's obviously one of the biggest industrial real estate holders in the country and globally, I think, Apple, on and on. These are all on the left side brand names that every one of us knows and does business with or has done business with or will do business with. And these folks have spent billions and billions to bring solar power into their businesses, um, get that part of their business operations off the grid, zero pollution, fixed cost, um, all those other attributes I just talked about. So uh, the good news is um, the big boys have, have already de-risked it. And that's why I had the term low risk up front is these guys have already uh, really tested solar in the corporate real estate world um, so that for, let's say, any of you folks that are local businesses, you're not Target or Walmart, but you've got a building and you have an interest in solar, absolutely can work for you just as it has for them. And here's the top 10, because this is a little more readable. 
Um, again, y'all all know these companies, Brookfield number six and Prologis number three are actually, of course, you know, major commercial property owners and the rest are brands that happen to own a lot of their own buildings. So you got a mix here of the kind of uh, companies and properties where solar has already been deployed uh, on the rooftop. And this says on site only. And I mentioned that because uh, in addition to this, what a lot of companies are now doing, and it's also really accelerating, is that uh, they will also invest in other solar projects that aren't on their property. And by investing in that, they're effectively offsetting the regular grid power they get that supplements the rooftop clean solar. And so effectively, they're 100% renewable because they're buying, let's say it's like buying Green Mountain. And if any of you here have ever used Green Mountain or another clean energy you know, wind power offering for retail that we may use here in, in our area of Dallas-Fort Worth. So, um, so this just talks about those entities, the top 10 who put it on the roof of their buildings, because that's kind of the conversation in today's meeting. Um, now, beyond that, in terms of what's going on on a global scale, um, this is pretty cool. I, I don't know if anybody here, maybe we get to q and I'd love to know who knows about some of this stuff. Uh, that number is now dated. I think it's over 200 global companies now have committed to go 100% renewable energy. And it might be that they've already done it. Some already have, some of the tech companies in the US have already done it, like Google, uh, Apple, et cetera. Um, and they may have it by 2025 or 2030. It just depends on who they are, uh, the scope of their oper operations globally and how they can pull this off. But look at those brands. Again, it's these are the global brand names who have said, we're gonna have 100% renewable energy and at least in that part of our business, we're gonna eliminate waste, have fixed costs, um, and as they would like to you know, do the right thing. And so uh, again, hopefully that's news for y'all, but I'd, I'd love to hear about um, who's aware of all this kind of stuff that's going on on a larger scale around the world in terms of these commitments. And then I've made some references, but I thought it might also be helpful too if I just said, okay, we're right here in North Texas. Um, what kind of building slash company are we talking about that works best here? So first, of course, as y'all would know, um, to make an asset, uh, a decision about putting an asset on an asset, meaning a power plant on a building, you know, the conversation has to be with the owner, not a tenant, even though, you know, significant tenants, and especially if, they, if they're the sole tenant in a big property, they can influence their owner and their landlord. But this is a conversation with the owner of the building. Now, I would argue that not only the numbers I've showed you, but it really has to take an organization that says, we wanna do this. And maybe they just are doing other sustainability things, but they don't yet know how to do the solar thing yet because it's not that common here at all in North Texas. And so they, they, they want to, for whatever the reason may be, and the acronyms here, and I'm, I'm violating rules by having them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna spell them out here verbally. And I'm sure y'all know some of these. Corporate social responsibility, that's been around a while. That's a growing role in corporations. Uh, ESG is environmental social governance, another metric for companies, sustainability, responsibility. It gets into a whole lot of other areas um, like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that sort of thing as well. And then SRI is socially responsible investing. So whatever the reason, it's a, it's, it's a different way of saying they kind of have some sustainability DNA in their company in their company DNA. And as I mentioned earlier, they, uh, the company sees this as a way to improve their image, their brand value to attract whatever they wanna attract. Um, you know, uh, new employees, retain existing employees, customers, um, you know, suppliers, just anywhere in their ecosystem, you can use this feature of how you're improving your business in a way that's good for you and good for your partners and these other stakeholders. And as I mentioned, this is not um, very common here in DFW slash North Texas yet. So I would say here in our market, and that's why I want to tailor this now to this, you know, our neck of the woods where we're all hanging out, is um, this isn't for a follower yet because there's not much to follow yet. Those huge companies I mentioned like Ikea and Walmart and Whole Foods and Target, those are big global companies that make these decisions off at their mother ship. It's not a DFW decision about, hey, let's lead the way in the Dallas market. And that's really um, what it takes here. Somebody says, you know, let's, let's go do something. Let's show the way and 
we've learned that it is low risk. So we're willing to adopt early. And that's kind of the, the mindset uh, that uh, needs to be present as well, just like that interest in you know, having sustainability DNA. And that ties into this next point about being innovator and everybody likes to think of themselves as innovative and in some way, so many companies are. And this is just another way in terms of how we use power and how we operate the business and the building, that kind of innovative mindset. Um, I mentioned earlier that the tax credits, which of course they can be used over many years, but you know, a tax credit really only works if you're making money. If you've got a, a liability on an annual basis to send money up to the, uh, to the IRS, to the treasury, then this is gonna be a really exciting thing because in the example I used earlier in the discussion, where that $700,000 tax credit Imagine, you know, a lot of businesses, $700,000 that can pay for a bunch of people that can change some aspect of your distribution center that can uh, fund some software you need to, to upgrade your IT. I mean, who knows? So the point is, um, you, you get this tax credit back that helps fund and fuel and, and improve other parts of the business. So that's a that's a internal decision, but it's an opportunity for anybody that does this to know that they're going to have. And then finally, about the building itself. Um, you know, we don't want to put this on a, you know, 15 story building with a little footprint at the top of a lot of load. We need it instead to look more like a, you know, a tissue box, a Kleenex box, one to three stories, whether it's, you know, low rise office, multi-use, or certainly industrial. Industrial is the obvious one that comes to mind, massive square footage on the rooftop and a lot of load underneath. Um, and then I mentioned 25,000 of available uh, square feet of roof. Um, just because that makes the numbers work a little bit better because then the soft costs of any business transaction are, are less of a factor. So, um, and, and our inventory of, you know, properties in DFW that have at least, let's say if it's 25,000, that means it's a 35, 40, 50,000 square foot uh, building in terms of its roof footprint. We've got lots of that inventory, as y'all know, in the built environment here, it's crazy. Um, and then a good building in a good neighborhood um, I only say that because um, guys that loan money, um, you know, they, they like good buildings and good neighborhoods. What can I say? I'm just, you know, I'm not the money guy. I'm just, I know how they are because I, I hang out with them a fair bit. <laughs> so um, now finally, um, and I'll, I'll just, we'll do the honor system later because we don't have to, we can vote on this if you want to do it in chat. But here's the trivia question about solar. Who won the 1921 Nobel Prize for Physics? So 100 years ago, it's kind of a cool year that here we are in 2021. So if you happen to know this, I'm really impressed. You're a, a physics nerd or you just happen to stumble across this or you're a lucky guest, it doesn't matter. But anyway, um, we'll, we'll tell you now, I'll reveal the answer right now, which is Albert, Einst Albert Einstein. So I think most people would associate with him in the 30s probably winning a Nobel Prize for the theory of relativity, but no, it was many years earlier, as it says down there in the red circle, the photoelectric effect, the photovoltaics that I showed you about in the very first slide, he came up with this and I don't know how he did it, but brilliant, 100 years. So it's not like somebody just came up with this a few years ago or NASA did. Um, many people know that NASA of course used it early when it was crazy expensive on rockets to have power in space because it was always in range of the sun. So it had power 100% of the time, but uh, it goes all the way back to Albert Einstein. So there's some trivia question if you ever need to, you know, win a, uh, a trivia contest at a bar because you need a beer and you're out of money, then use that one. I'll bet nobody will uh, get that one. And then uh, finally, just to wrap up um, a little bit about what, what our business does, MM Solar Advisory is focused on serving local, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, DFW, North Texas organizations with um, helping them uh, get tailored best of breed solar solutions. Um, and that means that through the process, it's all about listening and understanding first, meaning a lot of what I just talked about, what really matters, like a company goes, that tax credit, or we need to, we've got a lot of pressure in our industry and in our business to um, do things sustainably in our operations. So we need to do it for that reason. Or we think our hiring, we're growing the business and we want to have one other goodie to tell young people that we're doing that will attract them to us, whatever the reason may be. So that's the first thing we do is listen, ask a lot of questions like, why would you really want to do a solar project? 
and convince us that you really want to or should. And then we'll take you through this process, which is listed here, which is just get you all the way through it in terms of fix it, figuring out how can we finance it and who can engineer and build it for us? Because MM Solar Advisory does not do that. We bring in the parties who can then do the detailed engineering with licensed engineers, uh, use those designs to get the permits and to procure the materials and to obviously the design for which uh, the project will be built. So the term EPC, Engineering Procurement Construction, as you're familiar with in the commercial real estate business, it's the same term here. Uh, I introduce one or multiple EPCs that ultimately one would be selected to get this project done and implement it on the rooftop. Um, and my job is to serve my client, um, manage that thing all the way to the end of the, where we have the barbecue party with the lemonade at the end and, uh, and celebrate solar power on the roof. And then you forget about it because it's hiding on the roof and you never know it's there. And then I'll close with some humor. Um, I mean, just look at this. Um, what's the downside? I mean, you know, I, I just think this is hilarious. I mean, <laughs> you know, what if we create a better world for nothing? What if we improve our building for what? I mean, it has all this other impact on your community and on the planet. If you're into that sort of thing, I may be am, but that doesn't have to matter to my client. Um, whichever these things matter to my client, that's what I'm going to worry about. But I think this is funny. Um, I got license from the artist to use this. Um, and it's on my website and I like to pull it out because it's like, <clears throat> gee, what is the downside? Hmm. It's a good question. I haven't heard a good answer from anybody. Um, so, so that's that. Um, I really appreciate the time to walk you through that. I hope that was useful and helpful. And um, we can do Q&A time now. Uh, Allie, would you like me to stop sharing? Would that be helpful? So we can see everybody. Oh, Allie, you're muted. I am muted. There we go. We're good. There, now I can yeah, see. Yeah, that'll be great. Um, everybody can just kind of toss in their, their questions now if they would like. Uh, we see a couple. Um, so first off, how... And I know you said that you brought in um, multiple people, like outside entities to help us um, kind of decide which is best for us. What are kind of the different like levels of um, like, do some make different amount of power? How do you choose which is best for your property? Okay, yeah, great question. The good news is it's not real complicated. Um, for the most part, yes, there are solar panels, solar modules that I referenced that have a little bit different um, output. Some put out a little bit more power, some, power, some put out a little bit less, but the cost per kilowatt hour, which is the metric for you know electricity, kilowatt hour, is, is pretty similar. So it's really about, um, the, the differences are really more around um, the firm and their experience. And um, maybe if you have other projects to do, um, and also, you know, some might actually have, a, a, for whatever reason, because there's seasonality to, like a lot of things, there's seasonality to perhaps the cost of one supplier's products versus another. So we just want to make sure we're doing the best job of in this market at this time when we're making a decision for your property that uh, we're not missing anything in terms of what's the best economic decision right now and the firm of the right credentials that you're comfortable with. It's not my decision. It's, you know, it's your decision to go, I like that company over that company because uh, of the project manager they're going to put on it and or uh, based on other similar projects they've done. So um, there's not going to be some wild difference in the technology. So if that was a part of the question, that won't be the case. Um, because uh, to some extent, solar panels have become pretty commoditized now, which is good. They're getting cheaper and they work really well. And they have, I didn't mention, 25 year warranties. So who has ever bought anything with a 25 year warranty? I mean, it's nuts, isn't it? So. That's awesome. And also you mentioned um, young people liking, uh, liking that their job, yeah, I am one of them. I as the, the token millennial here, I can echo that. Um, but also, so I have a couple questions in here as well. There's how do these hold up um, in different weather options, as, uh, especially hail with North Texas? Now, I can show you my notepad here and say, here's a question I'm going to get. And that's one of them because I yep. always get 
because we're all scared about hail in North Texas and it can be pretty crazy. Um, so think about it this way. Um, after we have one of those hailstorms, and then you know how the state hailstorm comes through and then the day is beautiful and the next day is beautiful. And you pull up at a stoplight and you look at the guy next to you and you go, oh, he was in the hailstorm yesterday. Which part of their car looks bad? The top. The metal, not the glass, right? Because if he didn't have a windscreen, he wouldn't be driving. But the metal's got bumps all over it, right? So um, auto glass is basically what is the outside surface of a solar panel. So there's your, think about it that way, that, you know, cars, you know, survive at the windows as you do, the metal takes the beating for the body shop, right? So, and you can go online and look at, uh, you know, you can go Google or search for like underwriters laboratories or what you can look at lab tests for um, solar panels and they'll be shooting these um, not quite golf ball size bearings at like 50 feet across a room and hit a solar panel and they just fall off. They just hit it and drop. So they test the hell out of them. This is why they have the 25 year warranties. And this is why the guys with all the money finance solar projects that are tended to last 20 to 30 years is because the warranties and they know that they're already tested to last that long. So without those, without that being real, the money would never be there. Guys are not going to, and by the way, I'm sorry, I have four daughters. I just say guys, cause I talk that way. I, I just want to be clear. Um, but you know, the guys with the money, they're not going to place the money if they think a 25 year supposed asset is going to fail in five years. There's no way they're going to be putting the money in the market, but they do because it's not a concern. And that's another aspect of low risk, man. This stuff just lasts. That's awesome. And actually that, that goes right into another uh, question is what's the lifetime of these things? Um, 25, 30 years. Yeah. Now that's, that's how long, like, you know, that graph I showed you and we'll get to Anna, you're raising your hand. We'll get to you next. If that's okay, Allie. Yeah, um, I saw her waving. So the graph that showed the up and to the right value proposition over 25 years says, if we install this and leave it there, that's, that's how it's going to look. Now, what I think is going to happen, and it's going to start happening pretty soon in our industry because of the volume and the cost declines, is it'll become a financial decision in 5, 10, 15 years and go, hey, the technology has improved so much. Let's take that old one out. Let's put a new one in that'll produce twice as much power for half that investment we made 10 years ago. And let's take the old panels that still work. Let's give them to a church. Let's give them to a nonprofit. Let's put them in the recycling market, the reuse market, and it'll be a financial decision. It won't be because you have to. And again, the parallel or the, the, the inverse is these things. These phones don't last after two or three years or computers because the internet and the software kills them and they just, they just fail. We've all been there. I guarantee everybody here has experienced that. That won't happen with the solar panel because it's a logical thought will what happens when we get new solar technology? Well, the next project you do will be even better, but the one you have already invested in is still going to deliver. It won't fail to perform. So that's kind of the analogies I draw there. Awesome. And you said Anna was raising her hand? I saw her waving over there. <laughs> yeah, um, I had, well, so does the warranty cover hail damages or would we have to go through insurance? Would insurance cover that? Great question. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but what I will tell you, Anna, is that for, for normal hail, yes, because that's kind of, as I described, the testing environment they've already been through. When you get to uh, baseball, softball size hail, it's always call your insurance agent, right? It's like, holy cow. Um, personal story there in 2016, you remember the one that was in uh, Wiley, Texas? I was in that hailstorm because my kid, one of my kids, one of my four daughters I mentioned, my third daughter, I picked her up at 6 p.m., near Wiley. She'd been riding a horse. I picked her up. I looked at the weather. I said, I think we can skirt around this this way. Well, I was dead wrong. I should have stayed at the barn and we should have gone inside. I get five minutes away. That storm came upon us. And I mean, we get in downtown Wiley parked next to a building and you would not believe how $12,000 worth of damage to my car, just ob obliterated. And some of the hail was so big, it did break my window. So and you may have heard in that storm, because I think that was the last really big one, or it was one of the last really big ones. It was going through people's walls of their homes, right? So nobody can make a product sustain, sustaining that kind of damage, Anna. But most weather, most storms, normal Texas hail, sure, it's going to be fine. And, and it would be a warranty claim, yes. Now, you still got to pay somebody to come out and probably put it up. But, you know, anyway. Thank you so much. Sure.
So we have a few more. So Lacey Dowden uh, first would like to uh, tell you she appreciates your think mug. Um, Chris Boy, and go Chris. Also, <laughs> and then also, um, does roof R&M change much any after solar is installed? What does the ongoing maintenance of an installed solar system look like yearly inspections, et cetera? Yeah, great question. Uh, who's that, Lacey? So for the most part, here's what the solar EPCs around here will tell you. And I think it's mostly true, but mother nature, like we just had you know, recently, right? We have good mother nature here. She comes and washes things off, cleans things off. We're not in West Texas. We're not in ag country. We don't have a lot of stuff that coats solar that's gonna impede and reduce its performance. But I still advocate for a client and if they don't want to do it in the first year, that's fine. But I think you should prepare to then have an annual maintenance contract, mainly just for cleaning. It, it's not to replace anything. So the wind, the wind industry, for instance, has a lot of mechanical parts and turbines and you know, blah, blah, blah. There is kind of like a car. You got to replace stuff on mm -hmm. a schedule. Um, solar has no moving parts, um, really needs almost zero maintenance. It needs a look at, clean it, and make sure it's performing. It's mainly about cleaning. Um, and not uh, repair and replacement of parts. So it's really inexpensive to add that contract into your project. Like the one I mentioned earlier, there's a million and a half dollar project. That'd probably cost, and it could be financed another, I don't know, uh, $30,000, $40,000 in the context of that whole project, just to go ahead and buy that maintenance for the, you know, for the long term too, just to make sure and buy, buy you some peace of mind. Um, it's really a, a customer option. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention, I didn't explicitly say it, and Lacey, you might have wondered about this too, never put a solar system on a bad roof, right? Y'all would all figure that out by now. If it lasts 25 years and my roof needs to be replaced in five, whoops, big problem, right, in five years, because the roof probably is still going to need some work in five to seven years. So you got to make sure you have a refurbished roof or a new roof. I would I just say a roof's got to be less than three to five years old to put solar on it. Um, because you're just asking for a potential problem and servicing a roof with solar on it is very difficult and much more expensive. So that's the one thing you do not want to do, but that's pretty straightforward. Make sure your roof's okay. Awesome. And then uh, Connor asks, is the 700,000 uh, tax credit per project or entity? Can an investor take multiple credits if they have multiple fields? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Connor, that in that case, that was a building and a project. So it would be broken out by uh, kind of the contract, right? So it's all about the, the, the business entity and what's the associated solar project with that. That's going to put the box around. Is it a 700K or, or I could have rolled up two projects in that, right? And that could have, that could have been a small portfolio, but that was one project. So it's going to be connected, the tax credits are going to be connected to the business that's investing in the solar asset. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. And I think that's all of them. Does anybody else have any questions? I do. Dennis has got Dennis, one. Dennis, I got there. <laughs> hey, Dennis. Yeah. Uh, Michael, this is re I'm really enjoying this. It's Thank my you. understanding that residential installation uh, total cost runs about five, three bucks a watt. Do you think that is correct? And is that about what it runs for on a commercial installation? Yeah, great question. It's about half of that or a little bit more on commercial um, and residential. Now, you don't want to pay three bucks a watt these days, unless you've got a really funky roof where it's going to be a complicated. Here's the thing about residential. You know, I've got a really cool looking roof on my house. I'm also in an old neighborhood with trees. So forget solar at my house. But, you know, um, Residential roofs are cool looking. They've got all kinds of angles and whatnot. That means it's more expensive to design the, the racking and infrastructure versus a flat roof. But um, 250 would be your target these days, Dennis, if you're talking to anybody. Maybe less. For, for Maybe, commercial? For, for at home. For no, commercial? Home. That's home. What, what commercial, you... I'd say buck and a half to buck 70 in that range. Commercial. Really? Well, that's. Oh, huh. okay. Well, in, in the work I'm doing, yes. And think, here's why, Dennis, if I bring in solar EPCA or solar EPCB, um, I've done a lot of work for them. And what I do when I'm talking to Dennis, the CEO, potential client is, um, 
I'm, I'm for the EPC that's coming in, they've got Dennis who's ready to do a project. So they're going to be very aggressive with price. That's part of my value. And what I know in the market is what they can do. I'm not interested in any solar EPC overcharging you. Um, so uh, yeah, buck and a half to buck 70 is kind of the range. And it, it varies um, based on market, you know, market supply. There's some of that that happens and it can go up and down a little bit. And that's for commercial. And that's just for the project itself. That's not for any other soft costs like financing and permits and all that. Um, but home, I was saying, is 250. Get down closer to 250 now, because I know, Ali, you're going to want to do that someday. And Kristen mentioned something, I think, about it. So home, don't spend more than 250 a watt on that. Okay. I've read some articles that uh, there's an anticipation of glass shortage for panels. Do you have anything you can amplify on that? Um, I, I don't specifically on glass. I, I think one concern we have about an industry that is growing and booming like it is, um, and I didn't even have any of that stuff. Gee, how much more solar is on the planet or in the U.S. or whatnot now from five, 10 years ago? I didn't even show you that, but it's, it's crazy. So uh, uh, there are some concerns about some of those kind of things, whether it's um, silicon supply or glass supply. Um, and the more visibility all the suppliers have to the demand of the markets and the better kind of global environment we have for working together because solar is a big time global industry. Uh, stuff comes from all over the world, right? A lot from the US, a lot from Asia, Europe. So um, this is where policy might make a difference in terms of we eliminate that glass shortage jacking prices up or causing availability problems. So maybe, um, but there's, there's people working on that stuff because the industry doesn't want to experience that because that'll mean prices go up or the market slows down. Who wants that? Nobody in our industry does. So it's a good question. I, I don't specifically know about glass, but I was giving you a larger statement about what could happen here and there at any given point. But um, I'm not reading anything that's keeping us up at night right now, but um, stuff like that can happen, sure. All of, these, all of these major companies that you show that are going uh, that are wanting to go to solar, how are they being sold when almost every building I'm, I'm aware of does not want any penetrations in the roof? The installer's yeah. not guaranteeing there won't be a roof leak, is he? Right. Yeah, great question, Dennis. So in the older days of solar, penetrating mounts were super, super common. Now they're much less common. There's a lot of ballasting and other kinds of clips and connections being done to eliminate penetrations. And if you do any penetrations, guess who's up on the roof with you before you do any of that? Your roofing guy. The roofer. Because the roofing guy's got his arm around. You've got your arm around the roofing guy and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. Hey, uh, Dennis, the CEO, you see, we're going to write this down. We're good. So it's a great point. Um, you don't just, you know, punch in holes everywhere and walk away because water always wins, right? <laughs> Um, so the good news is ballasted is super common now and other kinds of mechanisms for uh, installation. So that's very site specific. That's part of what the solar engineers that I bring in do. They said, I oh, will do it this way. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, sure. Just a personal question. Do you only do advisory work for the end user or do you also do advisory work for manufacturers and installers? Um, like, what do you mean? What kind of manufacturer? Like a solar uh, manufacturer? Solar. Oh, no, sure. no, no. I just, I just work with, you know, the, the building owner, right? That's, that's who I'm serving and gotcha. my client and all I care about is them being happy and getting what they want. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Everybody. Connor has sure. his hand raised. Hey, uh, Michael, I just have a question. First off, I do want to thank you very much for, your participation has been extremely enlightening. Thank you. Um, with regard to, okay, we're, we're coming up, this is fairly new technology, 25, 30 years from now, we're, it's a clean industry. What about the waste when these assets are, it's time to dispose of them, what happens to them, where do they go, and how and they be recycled because we're talking about, like you said, silicon, it's like throwing away a whole bunch of computers, motherboards, et cetera. Right. And then the glass factor, glass is certainly recyclable, but that's my question. Yeah, great, uh, great question. I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's important. I don't, I don't want to be a, 
you know, a sustainability guy where, you know, I've got blinders on and, and not looking at, it's not just about zero emissions out of the solar array. It's about the supply chain and all that stuff too. So great point and great question. So for instance, there's a Dallas company and there are companies all over the, the world. And this is a growing industry. It's just like, remember in the old days when you have an old cruddy old computer, what the hell did you do with it? Right. You didn't know. And you hated to throw it in the trash. Um, same thing going on here. Now there's a lot of the former electronics recycling firms are adding this line of business to recycle solar panels, break them down, take that glass, do whatever, take out the copper, do whatever with the reusable components and pieces, minimizing the actual trash piece. So it's a whole burgeoning industry now. And as I mentioned, um, what I do also, uh, we're starting to see is that as some solar projects are taken down to replace them with improved technology, it's still useful. So where could we use it? Um, and it still add value. So it's a really good point. And the industry is definitely all over it. The manufacturers have a huge stake in that because you think in the electronics business, you know how the manufacturers and the guys like Best Buy have had to sign up to take back batteries and electronics at their stores. Um, we're going to see the same kind of thing, I believe, in solar. It's, it won't be a, at a Best Buy, but we're going to have to have the same sort of responsible ownership of the life cycle of solar panels and solar technology. And then um, another question, what are some of the um, hidden costs that people need to be considered of other than the initial payment of the, um, the panels themselves? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I wouldn't say there's really any hidden costs because once it's running and you're getting power in your building on day one and you're looking at your meter, you know, let's say today's a perfect example. Um, HVAC maybe not running day. It's it's a beautiful day. The sun, the the solar array is producing power, and you know your meters, you're not you're not sucking in any power from the grid right now at this time in Dallas, Texas. Let's say that solar array is doing everything, so so you're good, and um, and so it, it kind of is what it is. It's not like you've forgotten anything or the. It's just you have soft costs. Like if you want to finance it, you know you gotta cost money to go through that process and whatnot. There's permits. So it's more this just some soft costs. And what I do with my clients show them all of those things, the whole stack of uh, things that need to be paid for. And there are no surprises and hidden costs then. The other thing would be, as I mentioned, that, that longer term operations management, getting one of those agreements in place, you might not do it up front and say, because usually you get, well, you usually get five years of work, workmanship warranty, sometimes lifetime from these installation companies. But you might say, well, we'll just wait and we'll sign one of those in a few years because that rate for servicing our solar rate will go down. We'll just wait. But if somebody makes you an offer to do it now and you want to roll it into the total cost of the system, just get it done. So I'm just thinking out loud about your question. No one's ever asked me about hidden costs. Um, soft costs and, and, and optional costs, yes. But hidden, um, really nothing there. If you've got a quality job on a good roof by a reputable in installation firm, EPC, it's pretty boring. It's just going to work. Um, so a good question though. I, I like it. I just don't, I can't cite, uh, oh yeah, here are the, the two key hidden costs to look out for. <laughs> uh, I don't have that. Okay. Does anybody or, uh, Oh, Dennis. <laughs> Michael, are, uh, these large, uh, companies, Walmart, Walgreens, are they selling any excess energy generation back to the grid and making it a profit center? I don't think they're making a profit center, but depending on where they're located, here's one of the crazy things about the power business in America, Dennis, is 50 states times, oh my goodness, how many different power companies, municipalities, you know, a lot, hundreds. So that deal that that store has for excess power selling back to the grid, it's different all over the place. This is an area where unlike other countries, like Germany created a federal standard, Spain, federal standard, US, never gonna happen. <laughs> so it depends is the answer. Um, but I think what they attempt to do is engineer their solar array to you know, more or less produce what they need. You don't really wanna generate a whole lot of excess because usually you get paid a little bit less for what you give back to the grid than what you have to buy from the grid at night. But what's really cool that's coming, when we do this again next year and a couple of years, is battery technology is now um, 
in North Texas will become relevant. Batter almost all solar projects, it seems, in the high priced of power markets like the West Coast and Northeast, they all have batteries now. So that instead of doing what you just said, which is sell it back to power company utility ABC, forget it, put it into my battery and use it at night. So you get the full value of that solar power you generated. You're gonna lose a little bit if you have to make a deal with the utility. It's just the way it is. Um, does yeah. that answer that? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Do we have anybody else, any other ones? Gone well, through all, all the I, chat box ones. Yeah, and I, I told Allie that I'll, uh, in addition to this recording, I'll, I'll be sending her a PDF of this material. So I'll, you'll have that for me. So um, whatever you scribble down or didn't scribble down, you'll have all my info and in this material for you to look at again. And I certainly welcome anybody to reach out anytime to talk more about this. Cause as you can tell, I like to do this. <laughs> Well, we appreciate it. There's a bunch of chats saying how much they've enjoyed it. And oh, we, uh, we definitely have enjoyed it and appreciate you coming and talking to us. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, everybody, uh, hey, enjoy this uh, awesome winter weather. And uh, um, I hope 2021 is a um, really uh, positive year for each of you because we've all lived through a really tough last year. It's uh, So I'm positive about this being a much more, um, a better year in many ways. For, and I hope, I hope that's the case for each of y'all. Thank you, Michael. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank Connor. you so much. Thank you much. <clears throat> Bye, everybody. Take care. Y'all have a good one.